I'm Andrew Kitley, and this is my podcast, The Invisible Gift, a show about turning disability into possibility. From a young age, I was told I had a disability that would make it impossible for me to achieve and flourish in life. I struggled in school and felt I was not truly understood or supported. On my long road to becoming the owner of multiple businesses, I have learned that dyslexia was not my disability, but rather my invisible gift. My dyslexia challenged me every day, but it was also what made me into an independent thinker, a creative and gave me that hardworking mindset that has taught me to never be discouraged by failure. I realized there are many people out there just like me. So I wanted to learn more about them and dyslexia itself. I realized I needed a way to do this, which was great for dyslexics, which obviously rules out writing anything down and makes total sense why a podcast is perfect. I'm excited to be sharing this journey with you as we learn more about dyslexia, the incredible people that thrive with it and how we can all transform our greatest challenge into our invisible gift. Welcome to my podcast. Today on the podcast, I'm honored to have the incredible poet, Philip Schultz. Philip grew up in an impoverished neighborhood in New York in the 40s. He couldn't read till he was 11 and his family struggled financially throughout his young age. What they didn't know at the time is he would go on to be one of the world's greatest poets. Despite not being able to read till so late, he would start his own writing school in 1987 and would eventually become a Pulitzer winner in 2008 for his collection, Failure. In our conversation, we spoke at length about his childhood, his writing school, his poetry, and how profoundly dyslexia impacted his poetic voice. But first though, we spoke about the upcoming election and how he first found out about his dyslexia. I hope you enjoy the conversation. How's coronavirus going for you over there, Philip? Well, we're avoiding it. We're, we're 110 miles east of uh, the city, and um, our kids are, one's in law school in California, and the other is um, undergraduate in Vermont. So they seem to be safe, and my wife and I are just laying low here. <laughs> it's nearly vote day for you, isn't it? We voted yesterday, and... Um, uh, yeah. The election is a week away, exactly seven days away. I, it's, I think everyone in the world is waiting on bated breath on this. <laughs> I somehow survived um, the draft in Vietnam and protests in the 60s and Watergate, but never anything quite like this. No, no. It's funny, isn't it? Never, never had a deal with a monster. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Right. So thank you for coming on the podcast. Um, I really appreciate it. I feel a bit honored to have you on the podcast, really. Um, reading is one of my vices. Um, and I have read your works before, which is is really, really amazing. I mean, unfortunately, if, because of my dyslexia, everything tends to blend into one. Um, I, re- I regularly quote books to other people and get the wrong authors on it. So I have been told off for doing that in the past. Um, <laughs> so when did you first find out you were dyslexic? Well, um, when my oldest son was diagnosed with it in second grade, I was, I believe, 58. Um, and it, uh, I, all this, you know, the neuropsychologist listed off all the symptoms and I realized that, oh my God, that explains my life too. <laughs> it explains my childhood <laughs> too. Although until that moment, I had no idea. I couldn't even tell you what dyslexia was, I don't think. No, it's a, it's a it's a common trait. I'm not even sure, even though I'm doing this, I'm still not really sure what dyslexia is. It's not. It just feels like a, a name, really. But I suppose I, I now because I've met so many amazing people doing this. Um, it feels like when I hear dyslexia, I hear creative and and uh, just thinks about things differently. So obviously, what you do is really really creative. Have you always been a creative person? Yes, uh, without being conscious of it. I mean, um, it was, uh, my childhood was, uh, my father was born in Russia. 
it, it, I grew up in a very immigrant, lower class, inner city neighborhood in upstate New York, Rochester, New York. Uh, both grand grandfathers um, came over here as tailors and steerage. They, you had to have something and you had to have a profession in Ellis Island to get in. So they taught one another what their own trade. So a lot of them became tailors. And um, mm -hmm. the Rochester was where all the uh, men's garments, uh, the men's uh, tailoring factories were because of all the water for the mills. Mm -hmm. And um, my um, so the world I grew up in was quite quite unique, and um, uh, I mean I wouldn't change it for anything because it's it it was full of um, I, uh, there were some Jewish families, but predominantly not uh, mostly Eastern European. Um, uh, families there and there was a lot of hostility and a lot of um you know it was tough it was it was growing up on the mean streets so yeah. i learned how to um, fight and take care of myself and 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 survive and um so i was busy with other things and i didn't seem to pay a lot of attention to the fact that i did poorly in school and i ended up being held back twice and um, ended up at the worst of all the schools, didn't learn how to read. I, um, I finally, I was 11 in, I believe, the fifth grade. Uh, many of the kids I grew up around, some of them died in Vietnam, others went to reformatory. It was, it was a world in which dyslexia, looking back through that lens, explained a lot but not everything yeah. but not everything <laughs> <laughs> the life of the imagination for me was a was a more feasible safer uh, life a kind of island uh, yeah. than the one outside so i created an imaginary uh, inner life without knowing it I like to think, well, I don't like to think, I've definitely done that in my own life. Um, a vivid imagination is probably what everyone would say about me and oh, I've always found, I never really found an outlet for it outside of really martial arts. That was my only main outlet activities. So how did, so when you say you used to get, I'm just trying to think of your creative process here. So when you, created this imaginary world you used to live in was it really visual for you or was it was it completely mental because for me the the, world, the alternative worlds i used to create were so visual it was it was really it felt like i was there when i was in them is that a similar to you well that's a very good question that's a very interesting question um because what i neglected to point out was um I, the, my first outlet for uh, creativity was painting and drawing. I um, mm. once was in a department store and I saw a book of Van Gogh's paintings. And I was mm. so overcome and struck that I stole it. I stole the book. I mean, I didn't have any money and I wanted the book. And kids like, the, kids like me did things like that. <laughs> I got I got I got caught, and my father had to come down and get me. He wasn't very understanding, but um, I would go back to that. To, and then I found in our local library a similar book. There was something about the passion, the visual passion in Van Gogh, the the transformation, the transcendence that he was after. He had obviously someone mm -hmm. with a tremendous amount of inner tor turmoil, as as we know, who mm -hmm. by p by painting, uh, translating all that turmoil, all that upset, all that disturbance into uh, a canvas, 
you know, whatever the measurements were, somehow allowed him to um, look at it. And because of that, that translation, the vibrancy of color was the passion was just so great that I wanted to do the same thing. And I would draw pictures all the time and I would um, uh, paint. I would get um, without, without knowing what I was doing. I studied it in school. I became a school cartoonist. So the first outlet was purely visual, and I like to think that my writing is visual, that I often write scenes where people are interacting, and it's taking place somewhere in a, in, in a, in a dog park after 9-11, or in a grocery store after Sandy, the Hurricane Sandy. Um, so... It was a way of, ex of relieving the tension of that inner turmoil. Do you still, when you write now, think, is that how you think of things? Is that how you come up with creative situations? Is that how you kind of visualize how you write things? That's a good question. Another good question. Um, I, I have to think about it. I, I'm not sure. The, the the this this lockdown this 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 lockdown that we're all surviving the tension of this awful um, election um, the uh, all of that has to go somewhere it 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 can go into mm. terrible stomach aches and headaches <laughs> yeah or it can go into my work I I'm finishing a book about my writing school which in many ways mm. comes out of my dyslexia. I, I didn't know that, but, um, you mm. know, it, it, I, I, how I taught myself to read, no one else could teach me. Tutors failed. I ended up imagining what it would be like to be normal, what it would be like to be a boy who could read. And I imagined it mm. to the point where I was able to maintain I was able to control the anxiety that wasn't allowing me to hear instruction and it allowed me to eventually learn how to read. So um, I, I created a method of teaching creative writing that allows you to use another writer's, another person's persona to to put between you and whatever you're trying to write about as a way of filtering it as a way of 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 holding it at a distance and maintaining sustaining some level of objectivity so in a sense my dyslexia and how i learned to do anything led to my starting a private school and a, a, my own creative method um, I, of course, I didn't understand that until many years later. <laughs> so when, what age were you when you wrote, wrote your first thing that really meant something to you? Around the age of 16, I was, um, I, I, I read the movie goer, a novel by Walker Percy. And I was mm. struck with the first person persona of the narrator. And um, I think it, it was so affectionate and personable and intelligent and philosophical that I could imagine doing something similar at some point. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think I tried to write... Um, poetry probably and fiction or I took it more seriously than I had previously um, when I when I was 18 I mean I, I had serious thoughts of being a writer but I mm -hmm. when I was 18 my father became ill he had a stroke and he mm -hmm. eventually died of a heart attack and um, I, I 
was dealing with it by reading a lot of Hemingway. And Hemingway had a lot of father-son stories. And my way of dealing with his illness and uh, an eventual death, which left us penniless, and I didn't know if I could go to college or even graduate high school. I was a senior. Um, I began to try writing with a degree of seriousness that I hadn't uh, felt before. So if I had already had the fantasy of being a writer, um, and it was a competition between that and painting, I was now a writer. I was taking all that grief and all that turbulence and turning it into um, writing. So I, I began a novel. Yeah. Uh, I was 18, just turned 18, and I started a novel called Amen the Redeemers. I have no idea where the name came from. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing to hear where Philip's journey as a writer and artist began. I was fascinated by how articulate and expressive he is. I was keen to find out more about Philip's writing school, his teaching methods and where he draws inspiration from. We speak more about Philip's family and the impact his father had and still has on his writing. First up though, I was keen to learn about how Philip's brain works and how he verbalises his thoughts. Did you struggle with verbalizing your ideas because obviously with dyslexia we all struggle with i i could say if even like when we talk now you're here i struggle to verbalize my brain works a lot better than my mouth does <laughs> so when i try to verbalize what i want to say it's it's hard enough in speech but when you go to writing i have so many problems with spelling trying to put the right word down is some, sometimes really hard for me it, did you find that hard when you first started writing i think writing was the only way i could do that i mean writing offered a conduit to um translate my feelings into mm-hmm. thought into ideas so writing provided me um with a way of of translating all that chaos into something mm. formidable into something for me that would be formidable so i think writing was writing and art before that were, were were the only ways i could do that i think my attraction to both to art was mm. a means of, uh, of trying to understand what the hell i was feeling what was going on so when you're writing something, do you find it easier to write your work in um, tougher situations or when you're in happier places in life? This is actually more of a question. I'm more fascinated when I speak to people about them writing some or painting. Some people uh, prefer writing when they've got stresses in their life, same as songwriters and things like that. And others prefer to do it when they're in a happier place in your life. For you, is it a mixture of both, or do you write better when you're in tougher situations in life? It doesn't feel like a choice. It, it's a mixture of both. I mean, I feel when I I'm passionate about anything. I, mm. uh, you know, when I met my wife and was madly in love, I um, expressed it in love poems. And um, when I'm going through something difficult, um, I express it in, you know, in a grief or I deal with strong emotion, passionate emotions, translating those into my work. It doesn't make any difference as long as it's strong enough to make me want to um, articulate. Yeah. So passion, passion is your power. I get that. Okay. So you say you're, um, you, you've started your own, you started your own teaching structure, you taught yourself to read. And now did you say you teach people as well, how to creatively write? Well, in the beginning I was, uh, you know, taught in college and for 20, mm. over 20 years ac- academia. I started a, mm. uh, a creative writing program, graduate program at New York university. Mm. Um, but I always had, uh, 
I always had my own ideas on how to teach. And I could see either when I was a, a student and grad, undergraduate or a graduate student in Iowa that most teachers taught according to how they wrote. Some, yeah. some liked the idea of their teaching and so many didn't being teachers. And then when I was in a position of starting a program, I was hiring people, so again, some of whom saw themselves as teachers and some of them saw themselves as writers who felt an obligation to teach to make a living. So mm -hmm. certainly in poetry, you don't make a living through poetry. So, <laughs> but I, there was a pedagogical this passion that I had about teaching um, people how to express themselves that like how I, what I did, had done for myself to survive I wanted to do for others and mm -hmm. so I developed a method of teaching based on persona writing long before I knew what I was doing and um, I did it in private workshops at home Mm -hmm. And I so much more enjoyed that than I did teaching in an academic environment that I, the, the, the one class became two and I eventually left graduate, I le left academic teaching and started my own school. So you're still doing that now, you're teaching your school now? It's called the Writer's Studio, the Writer's Studio with no apostrophe. Uh, how many students do you have in there? You know, I'd have to ask my wife. I don't really know. Um, <laughs> probably around mm -hmm. 300 or it, we have branches. Wow. We have branches in Tucson and San Francisco, a new branch in Rome. We used to have a branch in Amsterdam. Um, I, I have no ambition to extend it. Uh, it's just extended itself. <laughs> People would move yeah. and, and teachers would move and then ask if they could teach where they were. So th that's how it's happened. It's not. It's normally people that uh, r run businesses like that through passion that they normally do grow because you're passionate about what you do rather than doing it to draw an income. Well, I always find that everyone I speak to, the real the people that do it because they want to do it is the people that ultimately succeed, right? As someone put it to me, no self-respecting Republican would buy this school <laughs> <laughs> because of the <laughs> profit margin. It, it's, it is a passion. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, whatever it, this method is what I found helped me write. So it somehow helps others too. And they, they stay and they even want to teach in it. So it's taken on a life of its own. So if you've, I mean, that's, that's quite an expansive business. So this, this kind of brings me nicely on to the, the kind of next set of questions that inevitably always come with people who I meet who have dyslexia is, so with all this there's a lot of organization that comes with it there's a lot of um there's a lot of uh procedures and systems that needs to go in place to make sure things are getting out correctly and you're able to do your work so are you the person in your school that does that or you said i have to ask my wife or do you have a a group of people around you that help you yes i have a people i i'm not very good at all of that um I e even to do this podcast, there was a part of me that panicked in terms of the technology. I'm not very technological. Mm -hmm. um, it was a it was a small school with a few classes and a few teachers who were my students who just went on to teach and it made a living and I got by and then I got married and had children and the expenses uh increased and my wife helped build it up and um it became larger so i i don't have much to do with the technological aspect of the um uh, others others do that uh, yeah the, re the the reason why it's on this podcast the reason why i cover this sort of thing a lot is because i always say the power i have is the people around me and i think dyslexia kind of gives you that ability to get the right people around you to help you achieve your goals 
because every single person I've spoken to in these te- in this season um, all have incredible passions for some a subject in their life, and it's amazing how dyslexic people seem to struggle with systems. Um, a lot of people struggle with being on time and doing all these these different areas but they have amazing teams around them that are good at all that admin based stuff and help you deliver what you want to in life i mean i assume for someone like yourself you've probably always had to have a strong person or people around you as you as you as time's gone on right uh yes uh the a number of the early students stayed in in one capacity or other as teachers and um, it, it's a community and um, it's a very supportive community. And the idea, I guess you, I could claim comes out of my uh, struggle with dyslexia, struggle to mm. do, be normal in some way. Um, but um, in helping people express, I mean, the hardest thing in teaching, especially anything creative, is is encouraging and supporting people in their struggle to translate and what they really feel about the subjects they're writing about. Um, I could mm. basically most don't. Most people are writing about family or relationships or whatever, and they think they feel X and they really feel Y because what they feel with Y terrifies them. So they bury it, they repress it. And, or they want to write about old wounds that they're guilty about or whatever. And um, well, my example in my life is that for many years, I insisted on writing a novel about my father, who was a failed businessman. He um, failed over and over and over again and married my mother who wanted, who thought he was a big shot, owned a big parking lot in the middle of downtown Rochester, and then she could finally get away from this awful neighborhood and her crazy older brother and her mother and have her own mm-hmm. home. And she married him, and a week before um, the wedding, he confessed that he, he had a, um, an accountant who embezzled him and took, his, and his, took all his money, and he was penniless, and he would have to move into her house. <laughs> and wow. Even though she always regretted it, she said she married him anyway. And he and the few months that it was going to take him to get back on his feet became 20 years. So yeah. I she had to watch me grow up in the same world she grew up in. Um, yeah. How I really felt about him was very mixed at best and his last failure left us a bankruptcy left us all penniless i had couldn't go to college uh, my mother had to move back to the same house so the years i spent trying to write this novel i was writing a celebratory about his great energy how funny he was and not going anywhere near the rage and how i really felt and there's a dyslexic right. element in all of this. I couldn't dare go near it because I didn't know. It was too guilt-ridden. Mm. And um, finally, when I wrote poetry, it was successful. When I wrote fiction, it wasn't. Because in fiction, I was trying to write about things I didn't know. I was trying to put a lie to how I really felt. But there was something about poetry that if you connect to it, it's short and sweet and the truth comes out for me. Mm. Yeah. So based one of the tenets I do in teaching is that I help people take a subject and look at it in a way they may perhaps didn't look at it before. And wonder aloud and one you know, how how what do they really feel about 
what they're trying to write about. It's a form of discovery. It's difficult. It's often painful. Not, mm. not many people, not everyone can do it. But the writers who are successful are able to do that. Yeah, it's kind of like um, I listened to a podcast recently about um, psychedelics and they said about um, the psychedelics allow you to kind of almost look at the past as a different person because when you're when you're there in front of a situation you experience it one way but as you get older you would view it differently because at different ages in your life you view, view situations in different ways so if you were to go back as an adult and look at something as when you was a teenager you would see it very differently and process it very differently and i suppose um if you was to look at something, a situation, even if it was saying that happened yesterday and try and look at it from different eyes, you might see it in a different way. It's quite interesting. You get, you've got me fascinated, Philip. See, this is, this is your talent, what you've got. You've got my mind going crazy thinking about great things. I love it. <laughs> well, you know, the, this is the idea of persona writing. Oscar Wilde said, give a man a mask and he will tell you the truth. And right, going back to the Greeks with masks, you you put you use another writer's persona narrator, not to use their style, not to use their story, but to tell your own, and it allows you to tell the truth. And however unforgiving that truth is, it's funny. It wouldn't life be easier if the truth was spoken more often <laughs> is uh, not, not too obvious though. But I don't mind little white lies. <laughs> They're probably all right. <laughs> so with your, with your creative writing, when you, uh, when you teach people it, do you speak, how do you put it across? Because there's different ways of teaching. There's, there's um, kinesthetic, there's written, there's audio. What, how do you get your classes across? If you're teaching a class, are you standing in front of a screen talking or, or is it just notes? How is it? Well, I mean, it always was in person, uh, if that's what you mean. Now, mm -hmm. because of the pandemic, it's all virtual. But it's mm -hmm. the same method. I mean, you, um, you give exercises. Um, you know, we, we have a craft class in which every week we teach a different book of poetry, novels, memoirs. You use that person's persona, you turn it into uh, an exercise. We have different levels. I teach the master class. Uh, mm. The student takes that a book that they've read, the persona from that book, to do an exercise from it. They, they choose the exercise they want to do. And they practice yeah. using a persona to try to express themselves, so to try to express their passion. And once they mm. do it, it becomes something that they want to continue doing. Maybe what you're reacting to is, without any doubt, this method has came out of my dyslexia. The particular mm. struggle I had to um, access real feelings and um, compensate for all the things I couldn't do. I mean, I couldn't learn how to read or write. Mm. So I became a writer. The irony of that, I, I, you know, when I won a prize for my poetry, which was very nice, suddenly people were asking me, an editor asked me to write this book. I wrote a book called My Dyslexia. Mm. And I didn't know it never would have occurred to me to write a book on my dyslexia. And I really didn't understand why she was asking me to write it. So she said, trust me. <laughs> so I wrote it, a short book. It's perfect for dyslexics. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't until the reaction to it, which was fairly large, you know, it was two years after I wrote it and went around to LD schools talking in, in, in UK, in Liverpool, and prisons where a lot of prisoners are, are dyslexic. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it was took me two years to understand why she asked me to write the book. I never got it. I never got it that it was odd that someone who couldn't learn how to read and write and who was dyslexic would win a Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> it struck everyone else as odd, mm-hmm. which it is, but it took took it took me the, the longest time to figure out that it was unusual that someone who couldn't learn how to read and write would be a successful writer yeah because if you understand that irony um i just didn't get it um <laughs> but of course so i think the school the need the need to help others express those feelings came out of my own struggle with myself and it it it's very satisfying it's satisfying in a way that my writing isn't i'm very happy with my writing i'm not saying it's not satisfying but the teacher in me the teacher in me hasn't always been simpatico with the the, the poet that there was a fiction writer in me that hated the poet. And yeah. the poet was a little more accommodating of the fiction writer. Um, yeah. One wanted to have movies made out of his work and be successful. And the other yeah. one just wanted to express himself, to f- figure out what he was really feeling. Which one wins? <laughs> oh, no, no. The poet won hand down. I mean, I don't write fiction. <laughs> I, 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 the fiction was all... My most successful book is called Failure. A, a key subject of dyslexic people. Yes, yes. yes. We, 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 I always say every time we have a conversation on one of my podcasts, it comes back to, comes back to failure. I don't know another person that has failed so much consistently at such a young age than a dyslexic person it's always you always fail but you don't a lot of the time you don't realize it's failure but what it does is allow you to become very adaptable when you're older and failure isn't as scary it's just part of the process right it's the struggle is to overcome this image of yourself as a failure and even though i guess what i was saying before is that even when i had i didn't recognize it i didn't understand why anyone would want me to write a book about dyslexia i didn't get the irony but it's great irony (laughs) although philip was confused why people would want him to write a book on dyslexia i wasn't his journey from being 11 year old that couldn't read to being one of the most important poets alive and an icon for dyslexics everywhere makes him a perfect candidate for writing a book about it. Coming up, Philip and I talk about his previously unannounced book, the inspiration behind it, and we conclude our discussion with a performance by Philip of his poem, Googling Ourselves. Let's hear what Philip has planned for the next 12 months. So you've got, um, you've had, you've had an unbelievable amount of success up to this point now um it must it must be consistently hard to keep on bettering yourself but that poet's going to keep on coming out what's the plans for the next 12 months for you well i'm gonna finish this book uh on my school and on my it's a memoir about my writing life and all the po- all mm-hmm. the writers who mentored me and helped me and um uh so that'll be done that's a prose book and mm-hmm. then I want to get back to my poetry and write a book called The Artist and His Mother, based on an Arshel Gorky. I'm announcing it here for the first time, actually. Um, there you go. Um, based on an Arshel Gorky great painting called The Artist and His Mother, about how his mother saved him and his sister. Um, during the Armenian death march, the the genocide, and she died of starvation, mm-hmm. and um, 
he when he he and his sister came to America, he became a painter by taking a photograph of him as as a child and his mother and for 10 years doing it over and over and over until he got it right and the masterpiece it's a masterpiece and then he became more of an abstract painter but um his fascination with trying to render that relationship is equal to mm -hmm. i guess what i was doing with my father but now i want to do it with my mother and um the idea of the artist and the mother and his mother and, and his mother and um that that obsession with taking that visual photo and trying to understand it and pour all your feelings into it that um the role that my mother played in my in my life sounds amazing uh, i'm sorry I said, it sounds amazing. Sorry, you, you, you're not you're not just a good story. You're not just a good story writer. You're an amazing storyteller. So I find myself locked <laughs> into it's 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 because you you talk so slowly and it's really relaxing. I get so intrigued with what you're saying. So I I'm like because I speak so fast, but when you talk, I'm like, oh, what's he going to say next? I just get gripped. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sitting here and. It's my job to talk as well, but I just want to listen. It's really, <laughs> uh, just, it's been so oh, enjoyable. Thank you. You're being very generous. It's a very, uh, a, 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 and you're great uh, at bringing, you know, <laughs> I didn't plan to, to talk about any of this. And um, I'm, I'm a little surprised that um, I'm being so completely forthright that, um, Oh, thank you. That's great. That's that's nice to hear. I do I do worry. This is quite new for me as well. But I love talking to people and I love meeting people. Obviously, it's harder at the moment. I'm getting used to meeting people on screens. I mean, even me, even me, even meeting my family on screens and sitting there talking is is a bizarre. I love meeting people. I'm a touchy I'm a touchy sort of person as well. So it's really really weird for me. But. But yeah, I, I, it's been amazing. Um, I, I just I'm so extremely grateful for you coming on. It's, it means a lot to me. And you know, there's creative people, and then there's creative people. And as I say, you know, it, when they told me I was going to get you on the show, it's, it's, it was mind blowing. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. I really, really and, appreciate uh, it. Thank you. And if anyone wants to catch up with you, what, what was your university called again? Just make sure I'm plugging everything for you. <laughs> the non-degree program, and it's called the yeah. Writer's Studio. The right and and the um, it's writerstudio.com. Only one S in the middle. Writerstudio.com. Brilliant. And I'm sure everyone else is just very excited to see all the other stuff you do in the future. So thank you so much for coming on. I've really appreciated it. Good of you. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate okay. it. Okay. This poem is called Googling Ourselves, and I believe it fits into our conversation because the wanting to know who you are, no doubt, is have been has been influenced by my dyslexia, um, where you never really know, or you the doubt is always so great um, in terms of uh, trying to get a handle on it. It, it begins with a quote um, uh, from Nietzsche. You think yourself wise, proud Zarathustra. Then guess the riddle. Speak then. Who am I? These strangers with my name, it's Googling ourselves. You know, you Google yourself and you find a lot of Philip Schultzes. These strangers with my name, busy being kidnapped, embezzled, honored, and dying at a frightening rate. The cross-dressing exterminator convicted of rape in Kensington, Ohio, sentenced to 72 years without bail. The policeman killed stopping a burglary in Thermopolis, Wyoming. Could they have imagined the Florida painter with their name? communicating with extraterrestrials ter through sculptures made out of railroad tracks, 
or being written about in a poem by another member of their redundant family for a reason none of us can explain. Sometimes I fear I'm imaginary, don't really exist. Catch myself wondering why I only seem to like myself when, say, I'm wearing a teacher's face because I see myself only through others' eyes? In that case, who am I really? Alone at night watching a ball game, I'm always surprised when I speak to myself in third person, wondering why this man cares so much about something he plays no part in. It's easier to wonder why Nietzsche sought his soul's sympathy, a truth he knew he despised, probably feared he wouldn't survive. To imagine him up late seeking his ever-evolving, unidentifiable self, a past more inhabitable and less unforgiving, Anxious to know why someone with his name would say, Poets lie too much. Who among us has not adulterated his wine? Late at night, the web is a dangerous swamp, a voyeuristic self-scrutiny and addictive impersonation. The ego testifying for and against itself seeking evidence of triumph and complicity, sanction without malice, pretext, or God. Who is this man obsessively looking up all his persona narrators, feeling like a hodgepodge, trapped somewhere between heaven and earth, spitting against the wind? Is it because he knows he's getting closer to the end? will soon vanish and become nothing? Is this why he's studying everyone who answers to his name? Because one may have invented time or sympathy or God and will love him even momentarily for who he is? What honor to have Philip on the show. In my opinion, he's an incredible role model for dyslexics everywhere, and it's really easy to understand why with the way he expresses himself. Wasn't that live performance of his poem incredible? And I have to thank him for the exclusive announcement of his book, which is also an amazing first for the Invisible Gift podcast. When I first started the podcast, I never thought we'd be sharing something like this that has such a profound impact on our world. Philip, thank you for joining us. It truly meant a lot to me and I was inspired throughout the conversation. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did and I can't wait to see what Philip does in the future. Just a couple of quick notes before we go. They're important ones. First off, make sure to subscribe to The Invisible Gift wherever you listen to podcasts so you can automatically be notified about new episodes. One thing that's really important to me is to hear what you guys think about the podcast. I want to hear more about the challenges you're facing, what you're trying to change in your own life, work and family, and hear your inspiring stories of how you've overcome the odds to achieve the incredible. I know because so many of you are dyslexic that asking you to write something to me is not going to work. So I've worked with the production team on The Invisible Gift and we've come up with an idea. Grab your phone and record us a voice note. If you've got an iPhone, use voice memos. On Android, the options are endless. Once you're happy with your message, you can email it to me. My email address is andrew at theinvisiblegift.com. I would love to start sharing some of your audio notes and stories in future episodes. Also, and I'm really excited about this, head to theinvisiblegift.com because that way you can see the amazing artwork that has been commissioned to go along with each episode this season and also find out more about each of the guests I've had the pleasure of speaking to on the podcast. If all of this is way too much for you, I get it. I'm starting a newsletter that includes all this and more and it will come straight to your inbox. It's so simple to sign up at theinvisiblegift.com. You've been listening to the Invisible Gift podcast presented by me, Andrew Kitley, and produced by One Fine Play. This episode was recorded by Kazra. 
from One Fine Play, James Bishop is the executive producer. Kazra is the audio and visual engineer. Connor Foley is the editorial producer and researcher. Special thanks to Christina, Izzy and the Cube Studios. Thank you for listening to the Invisible Gift podcast. Thank you.